and welcome to Next Gen Tennis. I'm Mike Baugh, and today we have Bill Patton, and we're going to talk about alternative racket sports and how they can actually benefit the game of tennis. So, Bill, thank you for coming on. Glad to be here, Mike. You know, it's fun to be a regular. <laughs> How's uh, everything in California treating you? Well, uh, I'm over pneumonia, so... Uh, well, that's good. Yeah, yeah, I was a little closer to death than I like to be, but uh, I'm fine now and having love and life once again, so. That's excellent. <clears throat> so let's jump right into it, and let's just just pick it right up and, and talk about the, the big elephant in the room, and that's pickleball. It's, is it an elephant in the room? Cause well, I don't... for some people, like people like you and I, we just don't think it is, but then some people, they hear pickleball and – their ears start burning and they start going crazy and yeah well yeah okay let's unpack that because um some people have reason to be concerned so so it, some people have a real big reason to be concerned about pickleball if they're in a place where pickleball is taking over the tennis courts um yeah i have a friend in visalia california who's a tennis pro really good guy and he hates pickleball, and I don't blame him because because pickleball players are coming and taking over the tennis courts and chalking their lines and making yeah. making everything look terrible, and um, and then people who would like to play tennis on tennis courts can't. So they have this big political brouhaha going on in town, you know, at city council meetings to try to carve that out and figure out what they're going to do. So, um, you know, I, I think it's smart if communities can build dedicated pickleball courts. Um, that's, that's good. But, you know, we, uh, we tennis coaches and players are not very good street fighters when it comes to, no, I'm serious. We're, yeah. we're not very good at defending our turf. Um, you know, we, I think we need to get in there and do battle and go and be and have an uprising and go to city council meetings and say, no, absolutely not. You're not going to take our tennis courts away. Um, yeah, but on the same time, I think we also need to be really stagnant of, of still growing the game, too. Uh, I know there was just a study release saying that tennis has a 0.9% increase in play from last year. So there is, there's a small growth and that has been trending up for the last couple of years. But at the same time, you know, if, if you're not playing a regulation game of pickleball, there are alternatives you can do on a tennis court. The middle of the net is two inches higher without doing anything the sideline or the, the depth of the court of pickleball court is a foot on each side deeper than a tennis court um, from the service line. Uh, and then if you are lucky enough to be on a court with blended lines, then the blended lines are six inches wider on each side than a regulation pickleball court. So there's ways around. So if you take from the, service line to the blended line it's 42 by 21 a pickleball court is 44 by 20 and that's two inches off if we use the blended lines to play pickleball it's really not that big of an issue now when you get into competitive play where the court is a certain size now we could be talking about something else right but i think if i think if we had a bigger push with using those blended lines and finding a compromise there you know a 44 by 20 or 42 by 21, two inches in the net, the stuff's already there. It's already ITA approved, good, ITF approved. Good luck uh, compromising with the pickleball people. I, I, well, that's the issue. That's the issue. But if so, they want to put more courts in. Right. Okay, so now my understanding is that we want to kind of do a little overview of lots of different alternate alternative racket sports, right? Yeah. So, so you know, we wanted to kind of get in the pros and cons, right? So I'm gonna turn I'm turning the interview around on you now, right? All right. So, all right. So what are the what so, are the pros of pickleball? What are what's great about pickleball? Well, one of the great things about pickleball is you can have multiple levels of players playing with each other. 
you can have beginners, you can have learners getting on the court together, and it's very easy to learn because you're not having that overhead serve like you have in tennis. You don't have as much court coverage to cover in tennis because the tennis court is 78 by 27 for singles and 78 by 36 for doubles. In pickleball, it's 44 by 20. And so you have a lot, a lot less space. 44 by 20? I thought it was 40 by 20. No, 40, 44 by 20 is the regulation pickleball court. All right. Um, so it's, it's, it's a lot less space. So that includes a lot more diverse skill of athletes and the population to be able to include a play because there's a lot less space to cover. Like you could have some former first basemen and some bowlers can, could actually kind of come in and play pickleball, right? Well, I know in different clubs that they have more golfers playing pickleball than they have tennis players picking, playing pickleball. Interesting. All right. So here's a negative. Uh, I'm ready. I'll, I'll just, I think I'm just going to be the negative guy. So. You're good at being the negative, Nancy. Uh, but you know, <laughs> I can do it with a smile on my face. So, all right. M m I, one thing I'm hearing is that pickleball is a source of knee problems. And it's because of, it's because of the kitchen. So, so people and their knees and their low backs are having an issue because they have to stay behind that line. And then they're, they're doing this awful crouch, you know, to get down there and get to some, some low balls. They can't even do a lunge to get to the ball because that would put them into, into the kitchen. So they're standing they both feet right next to each other and and they're having a lot of knee and low back problems. I think the bigger issue with the knees and the ankles is it's all being played on hard courts, and there's a lot of short stops and starts, and I think that's tearing up the knees more than anything else. Okay. Thank you. for oh, See, and I'm glad you could come to the dark side for a little bit there. All right. Oh, I've, I, I've looked at a lot of dark things on pickleball in the last couple of years. Okay, good. You know, and, and I'm not – I'm not against pickleball. I mean, I, I think it's a great sport. I think, a, I think it could be a transition to tennis. I think people can transition from tennis to pickleball and play a racket sport longer, and that's great. Um, you know, my club is actually – I'm going to be hosting an alternate racket sport uh, demo day on May 5th at my club. Um, well, happy Cinco de Mayo to you. That's what that is. So, you know, there will be some alcoholic beverages consumed later, I'm sure, right? Because the cl our club always hosts something good that way. But anyway, I'm not promoting that part at the, at the, at the event. But anyway, um, so we're going to do pickleball, pop tennis, and spec tennis. And see, in my particular situation, my club has, has two pretty nice courts and two courts that have some very significant seismic issues, you know, from earthquake land. And so the courts are stretched and cracked and whatnot. So we're going to redo those courts. And the idea is that they're going to be turned into either dedicated pickleball or dual use tennis and something else. And now the interesting thing is the way those courts line up it's against the backyards of about five or six houses. So, so here's the problem that I've already found. I have alerted my general manager that we could be facing a pretty significant complaint issue from the neighbors whose backyards go up, butt up against those courts and the pickleball sound is going to drive them up the wall. So now, how do you mitigate that? So our particular problem would be, well, we're not going to be playing before 11 a.m. You know, you kind of have to be done probably by four or five. So you can't have, you can't have people waking up on Saturday morning to pickleball at eight o'clock in the morning, you know, right? So the, the sound of pickleball is a problem. And yeah, they have the softer, they have the, the, the paddles and the balls rated for less sound, but it's not enough. I mean, even 
even the most soft to sound pickleball is still pretty loud. And if you're not playing pickleball, you don't want to listen to pickleball. Everybody well, you can also you, yeah. you can also play pickleball with an orange ball. Okay, and and that's official, or or are the or are the purists gonna say? No, that's not that's, really pickleball. That's not official. That's more of a training type of thing to kind of slow down the ball and, and give it – because, you know, the orange ball doesn't bounce up as high as a yellow ball and doesn't have the same shock as when you hit it with the paddle because the ball's a little bit lighter and the, and the core of the ball is a little softer than a regular yellow ball. But you can play, especially with beginners, pickleball with an orange ball. Okay. All right. So So the – the positives are it's so I'm I think pickleball is the smallest space that of an of an alternate racket sport that's I, I think sport. you're right. I okay. think you're right. You know, now I mean I don't think we want to get too deeply into racquetball and 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 is squad. It still life? There's but those are sports that happen and clubs have them and people like them and yet the transition from racquetball to tennis is the worst because of the use of the wrist and i see people hurt themselves a lot yeah so that's a problem squash will lead to having you hit slice forehands which is interesting yeah um but i i see the transition from squash to tennis being a much easier than racquetball but um you know i mean those are some things that will always be around you know, because of the social structure that comes with them. So one of the, the positives about pickleball is keeping that paddle up above your wrist is what you do a lot of the times in tennis. Um, so it actually will help your volleying skills. But like you say, in the racquetball, there's a lot of risk going on because you don't have to control how far your ball's going to go because you're hitting the wall. Yes. In tennis, yes. it's a major control game because if you hit the ball 80 feet, it's now out. Where if you were to hit a racquetball 80 feet, it's going to stop by the time it gets to 15 because there's a big giant wall in the way. Okay, I'm going to come to the light for a second, you know, and and I think another thing about pickleball that's really strong is if you're an accomplished doubles player, you will you're just going to be a superstar in pickleball. Yeah, right. Because if you have if you have an overhead. You have good you have good returns, good volleys, and good overheads. You don't need much more. You will be you're gonna be a really good pickleball player. Yeah. Especially the better hands you have, because then you can do your like your third shot drops and then things like that. But go you, you you mentioned a couple sports and I wanna touch on them before we go any further so people know what we're talking about. And that's spec tennis and pop okay. tennis. Beck tennis is the one that's a little more arcane. So there's a guy, Nate Gross, in Northern California here who invented it. And so it's played with a paddle, um, but you could also play it with like a 25-inch junior racket. And, and it uses orange balls. And you play it on a space that's similar to a pickleball space, but there's no kitchen. So, so it's paddle or a small racket, orange ball, and a smaller space. And uh, you can go on YouTube and, and, and find some of that. And uh, it looks challenging. I mean, it's it basically, it's, it's tennis. It's probably, it's probably the closest to tennis on a smaller space. Um, so... I think my issue there is that you can't though truly play it on a regulation tennis court. You need to build your court on like one half of a tennis court. And so the way they do it is generally with throwdown lines. I'm a, I'm more of a fan of chalking it out if, if that's what you need to do. But now what about, what about painter's tape? It's some bullfrog tape. Be a problem. I mean, I've seen court surfaces come up with painter's tape. And I've also seen on hot days the gooey residue staying yep. down on the court. So it starts junking up your court after a while. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I would be really cautious about that. I wouldn't, 
I wouldn't put painter's tape down if it's more than 80 degrees. Um, and even, even if it's very mild temperatures, you're still going to get, you know, some of the surface is going to come back up, you know, from that, even though it's a pretty soft tape. So yeah, I'm a big, bigger fan of chalking. Um, a friend of mine has, has these weighted strings that he puts down. So he has little, he has heavy little weights and he, and he pulls the strings tight and those create temporary lines. And it's, and it, because the, it's a really, really tiny little string that's colored, it doesn't, it's not a tripping hazard. So you'll just step on it and it won't do anything. And you can, you can make it straight again in like two seconds. So what's the visibility like on those, on those strings? How, how well can you see it from like the other really, baseline or whatever? You've got them painted like really bright blue. So okay. you can still see it from the other side. Yeah. So, it, I, you know, and that's, that's a nice nifty little thing if you're not too serious about it. You know, you just want, you want to have a little temporary thing so you can play some 60 foot tennis, you know, or whatever, whatever your alternate racket sport is. So, I mean, at my club, I don't see our club becoming incredibly competitive about the pickleball. So let's move on. Let's move on to pop tennis. Cause I okay. think, cause now people, I don't know if they realize this, but pop tennis is the, is the uh, official alternate racket sport of the USTA. So um, regardless of your feelings of the big, you know, of the USTA, I mean, having, having that behemoth behind you is helpful. Right. So I, just for a second here, um, I don't want to break news or anything, but yeah. there is a rumor going around that in Lake Nona, they will be building pickleball courts. They will be building padel courts okay. and they will be building uh, some different alternative racket sport courts um, there in Lake Nona. Awesome. So that, that's a rumor. I don't know if that's confirmed or not if it is confirmed then i uh, hope you heard it here first okay. but uh <laughs> we shall see we shall see yeah so, i mean when we have when we have our little demo day i'm really rooting for pop tennis to be the one that takes over and this is the game that you see played at the beach so in southern california venice beach and other beach locales they have these little tiny tennis courts and you can play you can play pop tennis on a 60 foot court with an orange yep. ball and a paddle with the holes in it, wooden paddle with the holes. And you got that thick. Right. And you get, I think you get one serve. And, and so it takes away from having, and the, the service boxes are really tiny. So it takes away from, from the advantage of having a huge serve because you really have to be careful to get your yep. serve in. Right. And then it turns into also a really nice doubles battle and yet challenging enough. So I see pop tennis as being the closest facsimile to to tennis itself. Well, I've got one other one, but I'm, I'm going to bring that up later. Hold on. I got I Because see, see, from my standpoint, I think that if we're going to grow tennis, then we want to we want to play on a format and we want to play on a court and not have to have more than just a 60 foot line. So yeah. if, you, if your court, all it needs is a 60 foot line and now you can play pop tennis, that's a huge plus. Yep. Right? And then the other thing is pop tennis resembles real tennis more than any other alternative racket sport. So the transition to and from is the easiest. So I could see some six-year-olds learning how to play pop tennis, you know, much the way they would learn that, you know, they might learn 60 foot tennis or 36 foot tennis and graduate and play a little pop tennis with grandma and grandpa or whatever, and then graduate to the full court. So, um, you know, and, and when, when I go to the, when I'm in Southern Cal and I see the people at the beach, you see a really nice blend of people 
you know, young people all the way up to people in their 70s playing it. So, uh, so I like that standpoint. I like, I like the fact that it's the closest to actual tennis because the farther we go away from actual tennis. So, you know, if pop tennis is here and spec tennis is there and pickleball's yeah. over here, then, then, and then also pop tennis is not as noisy. No. So, so, so here's one that, that I, I feel like is even closer to tennis and we didn't discuss this in the pre-meeting. But that's touch tennis. Okay. And you get one serve. It's tennis, but on a smaller court. I believe it's about 40 feet long, 44 feet long. The service boxes are a little smaller, but you get one serve. You play with, a, I think, a 21 or a 23-inch racket, and you play with the high-density foam ball. And if you go on YouTube and you look up touch tennis, it's really big in the U.K., I feel like that that is it, – it's, it's awesome. Some of the points they have on there are just fantastic. <laughs> I'm a big fan. That's nice. I'm a big fan. Are I, you, I also think – You know that, what? I'm, I'm not a fan. I'm not a no? fan of touch tennis. You no, know, I've, I've looked at it and I'm like, no. I mean, it just, just the fact that it's a, it's a foam ball and the smaller rackets, I'm just like – yeah, but you should like foam balls. Huh? Well, you okay. Should... Let's not start other confusing conversations because because those uh, those balls that you're talking about are a training aid to help people hit a regulation tennis ball much better. But but now so I so I don't want to don't don't start that, Mike. <laughs> so so uh, let's go into beach tennis. Um, obviously you need sand. Yeah. Uh, you need to groom the sand. You need to take all the crap that falls in the sand out before you play. So you don't get tetanus. Uh, there's a lot of work there that needs to be done. Um, cause you're diving all over it, it. It's a fun beach game. It's a fun to play in the sand, but I don't think really beach tennis is going to appeal to about, I don't know, 90% of the country. Well, how, who plays beach tennis past the age of say 35 you know and you know it's funny because in with my association with this here uh this here bones original i mean we made beach tennis gear and so one thing i learned is it's the crazy italians that you can't beat in in beach tennis they're just nuts about it and yeah and so so that's a completely different thing because it's actually, it is the most, uh, I dare somebody to explain to me a more physical racket sport than beach tennis because of the diving around. I mean, high lie could kill you, but that's not really a racket, right? So, um, so I don't know. I, I think you know, that's a really specialized sport, you know? And I yeah. mean, one of the little funny things that people like is that smash ball thing, you know, where you got the paddles and the little rubber, rubberized thing. And that's it's a fun thing to like do a little volleying, you know, for 10 or 15 minutes at the beach. And then you get tired of it because the other person can't hit the ball to you, you know? I, you know, it's, it's, it's fun. I mean, I think, I think the, the bottom line is there's no like there's no telling someone what they're supposed to like, but yeah. the more people play different racket sports, the better. I mean, I, I, I think everybody, every tennis player should play ping pong. Well, that's one, that's one I forgot to write down, but yeah, table tennis is very good. It's so much fun. There's actually bars now where you can go to and play ping pong. They have a ton of, they, depending on where you go, there, you know, this one's called Spin in New York. I went to, it's a good time. You just, you know, grab a couple pitchers and play ping pong, and they've got different events going on. It's it's a fun thing. Well, and the, and then there are other you know pong games that they play at colleges. You know that. That's but a lot of those that involve your your throwing okay. hand and it doesn't involve the paddle right right so uh and a red solo cup right right uh, it's like, well it's good for aim yeah 
Yeah, very good. I think a lot of people are actually motivated to lose it at beer pong. I think they like to lose at beer pong. It's not a bad loss. Yeah, see. Because even if you win, you're still winning. If you lose, you're still winning. Yeah, so, so, uh, but yeah, there's no racket there. So, but anyway, that was a tangent. So, um, yeah, no, I mean, I think, I think people, you know, it, who, who every club should probably have a ping pong table. Um, and well, maybe, that's the thing. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, I'm actually glad you brought this up because yeah. I'm trying to get a ping pong table on my club, but we don't have the, we don't have the room for it. Ah, uh, that's, that's rough. You know, and yeah. then that, makes a, that can make a fun rainy day activity, you know, and, and the, the uh, the reflexes of of ping pong because the ball's coming so fast there's so little time in between that's really good for developing hands and reactions and 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 the volley game for sure absolutely uh, talking about reactions one of the fastest racket sports you'll play badminton mm, I hate bad. those those shuttlecocks can really get after it yes those little birdies. So yeah. in fact, um, I, I was teaching a private lesson on Saturday and um, Anya and I agreed that we really hate badminton, but Medea likes it. And I'm like, well, this, I'm like, sorry, Medea, this side of the court hates badminton. <laughs> no, and it's really an interesting thing because um, cause badminton people will tease you as they beat you uh, horrifically and just the way the thing behaves, it's very interesting. You know, I mean, it's so hard to read. But then yeah. the benefit there is the visual training. So um, I've trained a lot. A lot of my tennis, high school tennis players have also been badminton players. So the, the benefit, one of the benefits is that the, um, is that the badminton overhead is a biomechanically awesome serve in tennis. So very much similar, the, the be very best ideal, you know, serve mechanics. So that's a great thing. And then there's the, then there's the whole really, the, the speed of it and the, and the ball recognition. Almost every badminton kid that I've ever had has been a really good doubles player. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, going to another uh, game that involves that that type of racket is, uh, or not that type of racket, but involves having quick reflexes. I think is padel. Mm -hmm. Um, that's that's a big in Europe, big over in Spain and and whatnot. It's just now getting its start here in the U.S. Um. You want to talk a little because we were both at the racket and paddle show where right. Fidel right. had the big glass cages and and everyone was like crowning around and and, and watching Marco and and everything. Did you you got to play right? I did. I didn't play. I was. Oh, you didn't play. Okay. No, I was. I was pretty tired. So, and as a result of all of the insanity of that weekend, I ended up getting really sick. But anyway, uh, I did enjoy watching it and. Um, I think the, one of the cool things about Padel is like it's almost virtually impossible to cheat, <laughs> you know, because the only call is did it bounce twice? Yeah, right. I and, mean, and you're not scoop, and you're else, not scooping on a paddle. Yeah, just everything else is obvious, you know. So, and um, you know, and I think I think there's a, I think it's just it looks like a blast. I mean. Uh, that yeah. and and platform tennis are somewhat simple yes. because you're playing the ball off of the wall. So the whole, you know, the whole decision making, the quick decision making of okay, I'm going to move here and it's going to bounce there and it's going to do this. I think that that could even help some people with their doubles too because there are some things you know you get some really interesting situations where somebody like hammers their their overhead straight down and now it's going all the way up against the fence. I don't know. I know multiple times when I was playing at a fairly high level, I would run off the fence and make a lob. Yeah. This, these things happen on a smaller court, you know, when, 
when people are hitting these overheads that are going to go, you know, 10, 10 feet in the air and you got to go all the way up there and put your foot on the fence to elevate yourself. So a game like Padel is going to also kind of help you with those skills. But that again, you know, that's another really fun thing to do. If you've got the indoor space, right, do it. And then, then you've got an, then you have a rainy day activity that's very similar to tennis. Um, and, and especially will help with double skills. Uh, yeah, I would say, I think, I think Padel is amazing. And the same with platform tennis. And then, you know, there's also a training aspect too, because the points tend to be pretty long. You don't really get out of there easily with a, I mean, the only short rally would be where somebody doesn't return the serve. Yeah. You know, as if they return the serve, then you're looking at, you know, a 10 shot rally or more. And I've seen, Every time. Points, I've seen points that go on for a couple of minutes. And that's tough. That's tough to be able to go minute after minute. I mean, one of the things in tennis is the average points. What about 17 seconds? Less than that. No, on less, hard, less than on that. Court, it's like seven seconds. No. Well, the average shot rally is three and a half. The yeah, yeah, yeah. Three and a half shots is, is the average length of a rally. So, right. you know, serve four seconds for the ball to get back, four seconds for the ball to get back. Right. So we're looking at about 12 seconds or so. No, my, uh, my, no, actually, I think, I think a hard court point, the average point is four seconds. And on clay, it's seven seconds. Okay. You know, so – um, obviously on clay, there are some very long points that drive that up, but, um, especially in women's three Oh doubles. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Cause you know, cause they got to keep hitting that cross court ground stroke and nobody's gonna, nobody's picking that ball off going across the middle. Yeah. But Sounds. no, I, pa, pa, platform tennis is amazing, and it's. I think that you've, so far it's the most popular in colder climates because definitely up north. Because you got the heater, you know, you got the heaters that melt the whatever is happening there, and, and it goes play. right through the right through the the floor. Yeah, so you can play in the dead of winter and get out there and get a good workout. But I mean, I think that would be fun just about anywhere. And I, yeah. I think that's a great thing to do if you if your space at your club has a minimum amount of flat space to work with, because you because basically the platform goes up sort of on stilts and you you end up with a flat surface. So so putting those in um, is a great way to keep your people playing racket sports if your court space is limited by by the, your geology of your, of your club. Yeah, definitely. Well, Bill, do uh, you have any other – I think we touched about, about everything on the list. Um, do you have any more that you'd like to add to that? Uh, I mean, I think, I think the bottom line is that, um, you know, if, if you make these alternative racket sports something that you celebrate and you enjoy and your goal is to get more people playing tennis and giving hope to your people who can no longer play tennis, that they still can play something, then you're only going to help yourself grow the game, you know? Absolutely. Um, you know, so – uh, that you know that's the, that's the bottom line. Uh, but if I think I think people do themselves a disservice when they are um, fighting too hard against something that actually could end up helping them. With the exception being like my friend in Visalia, you know, who's who's having a hard time because because people are just taking over and there's no there's no sort of civic sharing. You know, they're just, yeah. it's just this takeover. So, um, so in, to some extent, you have to be able to fight for your right to party. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So I don't know if that was a Beastie Boys quote. It might have been. Uh, it could have been. It could have been. Anyway, Bill, thank you for joining. And uh, we look forward to next week when we talk a little bit more about the industry of tennis. 
and uh, appreciate your, your time and coming on. All right. Thanks for watching. Thanks. Have a good one.